Good afternoon. I'm Lloyd Anderson, the president-elect of City Club. Welcome to City Club and an out, another outstanding Friday program. This time featuring our host today, Tony Vecchio, who is director of this wonderful facility. I want to thank Tony and his staff in advance for making us feel so welcome, particularly a superb lunch, and for making this program possible. I'd like uh, to announce that next uh, Friday the 21st, uh, there will be a special presentation on the future of arts in Portland featuring the artistic directors of two of Portland's major arts institutions. Elizabeth Huddle, artistic director for Portland Center Stage, and James Canfield, artistic director of the Oregon Ballet Theater. We'll be meeting at the Hilton Hotel Ballroom, so please make a note of the change in location. On uh, May the 28th, in honor of Memorial Day weekend, there will be no program. Please note the membership survey that has been sent out to each of you members in the last week's bulletin. Fill it out and send it back to the club office if you could before the 1st of June. It'll help the Board of Governors and the club's various committees serve you better. Again, the deadline is June the 1st. Everyone who returns a survey with identifying information will have their names entered into a drawing for a free lunch. So, so far, 115 have been returned. Before we move into today's program, I have a special presentation that I would like to make to a very special member of, of City Club. As you know, the highest honor for City Club bestow the, the, the highest honor City Club bestows on any of its members is the City Club Award. This award recognizes not only lengthy and outstanding services to the club itself, but also recognizing out, rec recognizes outstanding service to the community. Because this year's recipient can't be with us for our annual program on June the 4th, we're presenting him with the award today. This year's recipient has been a member of the club for 41 years. Has served on research study committees, served on the Board of Governors, and is past president of the club. His community activities are far too numerous to enumerate here because he's either served on or is still serving on nearly every board that exists, not only in Portland, but the state. He's the founder of the American Leadership Forum for Oregon and has served on and headed numerous commissions for various governors and serves on numerous boards throughout the state and the nation. Currently, he serves on the, the Oregon Zoo Foundation Board and is its immediate past president. He does all of this with an enthusiasm, dignity, and generosity. When he was first asked to serve as president of City Club, he said he would first have to ask for approval of his wife, Emily, who is seated with, uh, here with him today. His name is Don Frisbee. Don, why don't you and Emily please come forward. Emily, first, uh, we'd like to thank you for your willingness to uh, and, and time that I'm sure Don spent away from uh, home and other activities of the family as, and loaning him for the year. And for you, Don, thank you for all the time that you've spent with the club and the help you've given to it and certainly to, the, to Portland and to the state. It's just been outstanding and we feel uh, really honored to be able to present you with the City Club Award. Don, uh, this is the award. 
I think I've got it backwards here, but there we are. <laughs> Again, nice. thank you very much. Very nice. Would you like to make a few remarks? Let me just say that I didn't know uh, Lloyd could be as eloquent as he's been the last <laughs> minute or so. <laughs> I think of all the things I've uh, been involved with, it would be difficult to say the City Club isn't right up there at the top. A wonderful organization that has for years uh, been the spirit of Portland and has represented <coughs> the city and the, the state in so many effective ways. And I congratulate all of you as City Club members uh, for your loyalty and activities in the club. Thank you so much for this honor. Our board host seated at the head table today is Susan Deskamp. A member of the Board of Governors and Assistant to Commissioner Charlie Hales. She will ask the first question of our speaker today. After Susan's question, we will open the program to questions from other members of the club uh, in the audience. The microphone is here. Uh, no speeches, please. The broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from Washington Mutual Saving, Miller Nash, Wiener Hager, and Carlson and Kaiser Permanetti. We're grateful for their support. In my uh, intermittent visits to the zoo after my children had finished uh, school and left home, I was always shocked when I came here. Pleasantly so as the changes, at the changes that had taken place. The surroundings seemed more natural, more attractive, more caring of the animals, and I believe the public has thought the same. The zoo has broad-based community support reflected in the over one million visitors that come here each year and the approval three years ago of a $28.8 million bond measure to help the ongoing capital improvements program. Access to the zoo was helped with the light rail stop at the entrance. No small piece of change in its own right. I wonder whether Ray Polani had anything to do with that. <laughs> a big commitment for a 110-year-old institution that's had its start back as in the back of a pharmacy. Maybe that's where they got their magic portions for the cures in those days. Tony Vecchio came to Portland a little over a year ago to head the institution. He's been pursuing his, pre, pre, uh, his uh, profession for over 20 years, starting in Pittsburgh, then to Columbia, South Carolina, Atlanta, Providence, Rhode Island, and finally here. Hopefully that's moving up the food chain. He's been involved in almost every aspect of zoos, and I suspect left the pitchfork behind early on as he moved steadily up in his profession. He's been active in numerous professional organizations, including the American Zoological Society, the, the Animal Behavior Society, International Bear Biology, and the American Federation of Herpet, Herpeticulturists, <laughs> snakes for short. <laughs> His technical papers sound a bit racy. Evidence for the origin of the consort relationships male influence of female hierarchies in baboons, and white-faced Saki stud book. I'm, I'm sure a bestseller. <laughs> Tony, we look forward to your remarks. Tony? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little story here. Uh, 16 months ago, I had uh, never set foot in, in Oregon. And uh, I got in a plane in Rhode Island to come out here for the uh, interview for this position, director's position. 
uh, it's a six and a half hour flight. So I thought that's plenty of time to prepare for the interview. Think of the questions I would be asked and think of what my responses would be. Well, kind of typical Oregon thing happened. Of course, in those days I called it Oregon, but I've been corrected since. But we landed in Detroit to switch planes, and as we were getting on the plane, an announcement came up that there's an ice storm in Portland, and the airport is closed. So I was stuck in Detroit. So in addition to the six and a half hours to prepare for the interview, I had another 24 hours sitting in a hotel room in Detroit thinking of questions that I might get asked in the interview and getting myself prepared. <clears throat> and I came out here and uh, met some folks that, of course, I had never met before, didn't know, and uh, started the interview. And a uh, very kindly, nice, soft-spoken man proceeded to ask me uh, questions, and I was just stunned. I had never thought of those in my 24 hours of preparation. They were especially thoughtful, insightful, uh, probing questions about the zoo's role in the community and interaction with the, the city itself. And I went through a long day of various interviews and called my wife from the hotel that night and she said, how did it go? And I said, well, it went pretty well. I think I hit it off with everybody except one guy who just asked the really tough questions. And she said, well, what's his story? And I said, I'm not sure. I think he's the guy that invented the Frisbee. <laughs> his name was Frisbee. <laughs> but I, I got the job, so I must have satisfied Don's uh, very tough questions. And I would just like to say uh, thank you to Don as well uh, for this last year. Don has been the, the chair of our, our board, our Zoo Foundation board, for this first year. And uh, I really uh, have come to rely on Don's uh, good advice and counsel. And uh, it's been very valuable to me. And in his soft-spoken, self-effacing way, probably doesn't realize uh, how much help he's been to me. But it's, uh, it's been a really good year. And I, Don has really helped uh, keep it together for me. So Don, thank you very much. Walt Pollock, our new chair, has some big shoes to fill, so good luck, Walt. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, the City Club for inviting me here today. That's kind of neat. I come here every day, and this is the first time I've been invited, so <laughs> that's, that's nice. Thank you, folks. Uh, I am the new guy in town, so I have a lot to learn, and I'm trying to learn the history. And uh, Kim Fried, our development director just handed me uh, this week a bunch of papers that were City Club um, publications that go back to 1951. And uh, can't honestly say I've read them all yet. I've read the titles and I've skimmed them and it's uh, very impressive. The City Club has been a very strong uh, advocate for the zoo for a long time. And in fact, that 1951 paper is the paper that recommended moving the zoo to the site that we're on right now. So obviously the City Club has had a lot of, uh, a lot of influence in the zoo and uh, always positive. So thank you very much and I look forward to continuing that strong relationship with the City Club. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you some stories. When was the last time someone told you a nice story that would put you to sleep? It's probably been, been years, but I'm going to tell you a few short stories. Uh, bear with me because at the end they will uh, we'll either tie them all in to what the zoo is all about or we'll run out of time, one or the other. Um, but let's go back a ways. First story. I call these you never know stories. Uh, with apologies to Rudyard Kipling. Uh, you never know story is a story about something that happens or something that you see or something that someone says to you that from that moment on changes the way you look at the world and the way you look at life. People might say, well, I, I know what you mean, some, you know, getting married or having a child, those kind of things. I said, no, no, that's not a you never know story. Those are things you know are coming, usually. I, I was in the South for a long time. I've seen some shotgun weddings, but usually you know you're going to get married or you know there's a, a baby on the way. So those things are very important events that change your life, but they're things that you expect to happen. A you never know story is something totally unexpected happens at a certain time that has a big effect on you. So let's go back 
to the 1960s. Remember the 60s? Heard it often said that if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. But <laughs> I grew up in the 60s, so I remember the 60s well. And um, I'm a city kid. I did not grow up on a farm working with animals or in the country out communing with nature. I grew up in a, in a very urban environment and didn't have much opportunity to connect with nature, which we'll, we'll talk about a little later. But when you grow up in the city, um, one of the things you do, uh, this was before the NFL was big, uh, we couldn't play basketball because there were always bigger kids on the very few basketball courts that we had available to us. So what we did was we played a lot of baseball, sandlot baseball. I had the most valuable house in the neighborhood from a kid's perspective because we had not only an empty lot next to our house, but the lot across the street was empty as well. So you could stand at the back lot and actually hit balls across the street into an outfield. Most uh, kids had to play on one lot and you really played baseball in an infield. You didn't have an infield and an outfield. So, so I grew up with baseball. We played baseball all day long. <coughs> Until the street lights came on, we'd have to go in the house and at that point we would turn on the radio and listen to the Pittsburgh Pirates on the radio. This was before cable TV and satellite dishes and even before independent channels. Right, you didn't get to see your team play on TV. You, if you were lucky enough to go to a, a game, that was great, but usually you listened on the radio. So, Growing up with the Pittsburgh Pirates, have no choice but to have as your hero a guy named Roberto Clemente. Remember Roberto Clemente? I'm from Pittsburgh, so you can't even argue with me about this. Roberto Clemente was the greatest baseball player <laughs> of all time. 14 uh, all-star game appearances, 12 gold gloves, four-time National League batting champion, 1966 National League most valuable player, 1971 MVP for the World Series. Great baseball player. Well, on December 23, 1972, shortly after Clemente had gotten his 3,000th hit, only the 10th person ever to get 3,000 hits, there was an earthquake in Nicaragua. Thousands of people were killed. Thousands more left homeless. Clemente uh, led a drive to uh, gather relief and aid for these uh, folks in Nicaragua. Uh, he spearheaded a drive to raise money. He used his considerable personal wealth and his influence uh, to get other people to support this drive to raise funds, clothing, food for the people in Nicaragua. And on New Year's Eve, the uh, four flights and taking supplies went left for Nicaragua. Well, after the third flight, word came back that maybe the supplies weren't getting where they were supposed to go. Uh, there, some black market things were happening and people were taking the supplies. Clemente wasn't going to allow that to happen, so he got on board the uh, fourth plane that was leaving. And uh, I will never forget, New Year's has never been a big holiday to I me. Mean, I was sound asleep at 11.45 and my sister came and woke me up and said, I thought you would want to know this, sorry to wake you up, but uh, Clemente was in a plane crash. And I said, well, is he dead? And she said, well, they didn't find the plane. It crashed over the Caribbean. So I immediately went back to sleep, not worried in the least. I knew Clemente was the greatest ball player of all time, was swimming back to Puerto Rico. I wasn't the least bit worried. But then when I woke up the next day, the fact was Clemente was killed in the plane crash. He, he died in the, in the crash. Now, um, it's a tragic thing for the Clemente family. and all of Puerto Rico where Clemente was a national hero. But if there's a little good to come out of it, uh, certainly changed the way I looked at life. I remember now I'm a teenager, sur having survived the 60s, I come from a whole generation of folks that grew up with terms like anti-establishment. Remember that? We used to hear that term a couple times a day, anti-establishment. Remember, never trust anyone over 30? That was big. Used to hear that a lot too. Uh, I came from a whole generation of, of folks whose career goal was to get over. Remember that term? Get over. Get over meant get as much money as you can without doing any work. Beat the system. That's what people were, were into. My, my fellow teens. And um, to me, 
uh, what a shock. Not only did my hero die, but as I uh, found out over the next weeks and months, uh, what Clemente was doing when he died was just typical Clemente. He wasn't just a baseball star. He was a guy who cared greatly about the community. And he had everything it took to get over. Uh, he had all the money. He could just use his natural talents to make a lot of money and could have done whatever he wanted. But he didn't. He used his money and his influence uh, to help his community. And what a valuable lesson for a teenager to learn, a teenager who's wrestling with, what do I want to do with myself? Uh, so I'm, I'm really, I would have been embarrassed to say that you know, my hero is a baseball player. But I'm 44 years old now, and I will still uh, proudly say that Roberto Clemente uh, is still my hero. Because here's a man who understood that life is not about how much money you make or what you possess, but how you live your life. And dedicating your life to helping others and helping the community is what he was all about. So he's still my hero. And it comes, um, what I learned from him comes into play very frequently in my job here. Because uh, kids often ask me, high school kids and college kids, uh, about career opportunities. And I let them know, if you want to make a lot of money, don't get in the zoo business. If you want the most rewarding job in the world and you want to be happy, pursue a zoo career. Nothing could be more fun because what the zoo is all about is uh, supporting the community. That's what we do here. We are part of the community. Uh, Don frequently says the, the thing he likes about the zoo is the zoo is for everyone. So that's kind of a typical Don, short, right to the point, and a lot of power behind it. The zoo is for everyone. Uh, we're a valuable part of the community. So the moral of that story was that uh, a measure of a person isn't how much money you make or, or what you own. It's what you do with, with what you have. And I thank Roberto Clemente for that lesson. Short story number two. 1988, I get a call from a couple friends of mine, uh, Sharon Matul and Amy Bodwell, the director and the deputy director of the zoo in Belize, Central America. They are organizing a trip to the Amazon rainforest. They wanted to know if I'd want to come along. They know I'm an avid bird watcher. So absolutely. So we go on this uh, trip. They know an entomologist researcher down there that can get us a, a spot in an Indian village where we stayed for a couple weeks. So we're down there having a ball bird watching all the time and the, the Indians that were our guides caught on pretty quick that these goofy Americans will spend all day watching these birds. So they said, you know, we know a place where there are a lot of really neat birds, a lot of different ones than you find around here. Do you want to go go see? It's an oxbow lake. It's about a half a, mile, uh, half a day's river trip from here. So absolutely. So we got in a boat and we spent the whole day going down the Amazon, up the Rio Negro, and then up a little tributary and really, really in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon rainforest. And we were, it was getting kind of late in the day. They pulled the boat up to the side of the, the bank and uh, got out and said, we're not there yet, but there's a, a place you might want to see up here. It's a, a marshy area where there are lots of birds. So we climbed up this really steep bank and kind of tramped off into the, the uh, woods there to find this marsh where there were lots of birds. And sure enough, they were right. There were lots of birds. So. Again, the Indians still didn't know us very well. They said, okay, they're the birds. Come on, let's go back. I said, no, 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 we want to look at them. We want to identify them. We want to listen to their song. We want to see what they're doing. And, well, the Indians are getting really nervous because it's getting dark. And they are just terrified of the fertilance, one of the most deadly snakes in the world. And they said, no, we've got to get back to the boats before the fertilance come out. The fertilance come out at night. Well, Sharon and Amy and I, we're zoo people. We would love to see a fertilance. <laughs> No, no, don't worry about the fertilance. We'll take care of the fertilance. Let's just stay here and watch birds. Well, the Indians get more and more frantic, and they finally convince us it's dark. You know, the fertilance are out. We have to get back to the boat. So, all right, all right. So we let them take us back to the boat. As we got back to the top of that steep bank, and looking in the other direction, I realized from there we look over the entire other side of the river, and we can see hundreds of square miles of rainforest. But now it's dark, and as we look out over the rainforest, I see this orange glow, which really turns out to be lots of little orange glows. And I asked the Indian, what, what, is, uh, what is with all this orange glow? We're you know, 100 miles from the nearest town. He said, well, that's the uh, farmers are burning the forest for their farms. 
And I was just stunned. And I stood there and I looked really hard. It's hard to tell because the glows were kind of going together, but I counted 28 different fires where farmers were burning the forest down. And I said, kind of grasping at straws, well, is it a certain time of the year? Is this the week that you guys burn forests down here? And he said, no, it's like this every day. They're always burning the forest. So that was, uh, that was one of those you never know moments for me because for the last 10 or 15 years, I had been teaching kids about conservation and rainforest conservation. And I could do all kind of cool demonstrations with lengths of string to show you how much rainfall falls in the forest. And I knew all the buzzwords, but it never hit home to me until I stood there and saw the forest burning down before my eyes. And I realized we're, we're in a war to save the world's wild places. And it's a war that it looks like we're losing. And the moral of that story for me is, is just teaching about conservation isn't just something we do. It's an, important, it's an important mission that we have. It's a priority. It's a mission that has a certain amount of urgency to it. Um, we have to accomplish this mission. We have to instill in it a conservation ethic in our children that, that somehow my generation missed uh, because there's not going to be much left if we wait too long. There's a very real sense of urgency there. Third story. A year later, uh, Sharon and Amy, again my friends in Belize, we've managed to establish a partnership between the zoo in Rhode Island and the zoo in Belize. And we do staff exchanges and uh, information exchanges and, and resource exchanges. So as part of that, you know, never send your staff to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. That's what I've always said. So I took the first trip down to Belize <laughs> to make sure everything was cool down there. And I did a zookeeper training workshop for a week which was really a lot of fun. But then at the end of the week, they, uh, Sharon and Amy uh, told me about a place in western Belize, right on the Guatemala border, called the uh, Vaca Plateau, very close to Tikal. If you're familiar with Tikal, it's a beautiful uh, preserved area of rainforest. So we drove uh, for about four hours on bumpy roads until the road ended at some farmer's field. We parked the car in his front yard, and then we went to negotiate a, a price for how how much it would cost to leave our car there for five days. We ended up paying them five dollars. Little did I know at that time that how much of my career would be spent dealing with parking issues. <laughs> but I got a great deal. Five bucks, five days. We left our car there. We hiked for another four hours deep into the forest uh, until we came to a plateau that looked at like uh, something out of the Cretaceous, uh, just a lush uh, tropical forest up on this plateau. And we had to hike up the side of this plateau to get to this uh, farmer's house where we were going to stay for a few days. Wonderful place. Spent the whole next day birding around his, his farm there. And sitting at dinner that night, he said, uh, you might be interested in this. He said, my boys have discovered a cave out in the woods. It's a Mayan cave that uh, no gringo uh, has ever been in before. And I said, what? A Mayan <laughs> cave that no one's ever been in? How do you know it's, no one's ever been in there? He said, well, usually when the people discover one of these caves, the artifacts are all taken out, the pot, pottery and things are all taken out and, or broken. Uh, this is a cave that has Mayan artifacts that are sitting there, never been touched before. So yeah, I'm there, let's go, let's go now. <laughs> so no, we'll have to wait till the morning. It's a long hike from here. It's, it's a several hours hike. So I said, okay. So the next morning we got bright and, up bright and early. And we uh, hiked across this guy's land, and we came to the gate at the edge of his property, went through the gate and started hiking down the road. And as we're hiking along, I notice the trees on the right side of the road and the trees on the left side of the road are all cut down and just sitting there. Not, they're not burned, they're just sitting there. And so we hike and we hike, and for quite a ways, the uh, trees are cut down everywhere. You look, both sides of the road, all the trees are just cut down and laying there. So finally I asked his son, uh, Michael, I asked, Michael, uh, what's going on here? I, I see all the trees are cut down, but they haven't burned them yet. Um, are they waiting for a certain weather conditions or what? He said, no, they're not going to burn these trees. I said, well, uh, don't they need to burn them before they can farm the land? And he said, well, we're not going to farm this land. No one will farm this land. It's too far from the market. wouldn't be worthwhile to farm it. So I'm puzzled here. And I said, I don't, I don't get it. Why then are all the trees cut down if you're not going to burn them and farm the land? 
And he looked at me like I was from another planet. I said, what do you mean? Why are they cut down? Uh, the people who own the land cut the trees down. I said, well, I can see that, but why did they cut the trees down? And it finally dawned on him, and he got a big smile on his face, and he said, oh, I see, I see what you mean. He said, you have to understand, my father is very old-fashioned. He loves the forest, and he preserves the forest on his land, but none of the other folks do that. And I said, I, I don't get, why would you not love the forest? Why would you cut it down? And he said, well, we don't, uh, the people here don't want to be viewed as some kind of, you know, savages living in the jungle here. We want to be like you. We want to be like Americans. So we cut the forest down. Even if we can't farm it, we just cut it down. We want to be civilized. So, you never know. Um, that lesson to me was, whether you like it or not, and whether you think it is right or wrong or colonialist, whatever you think, we are an example to the rest of the world. The rest of the world looks at us and looks at what we do and it influences what they do. And uh, so I may, may have argued with that at one time, but I saw it with my own eyes. And uh, that has really affected uh, the way I look at the things we do uh, here in the zoo. Uh, people are watching us and looking to us for leadership. It is our obligation and our responsibility to provide the right kind of leadership. Uh, story number four. Moving right along here. Just a couple years ago, I was sitting in my office at the zoo in Providence. I get a phone call from my curator of education. A uh, guy's a, um, a guy I worked with for many years. I really value his advice and we work really closely together. And he calls me up and says, I'm down here at a meeting with the CEO of Hasbro's Children's Hospital. You need to get down here right away. So, well, I'm in the middle of something here. Uh, I can't get down there right away. He said, no, you need to get down here right away. This guy has a great idea. You're going to love it. We're going to do it. You're going to be so excited. Get down here. Well, like I said, this guy knows me well, and he knows my schedule, and he knows how busy I was. And if he tells me I need to get down there, he's up to something. So I said, all right. So I go down. And we're chatting, making conversations. The zoo had an award-winning program for urban teenagers. And the hospital wanted to get in on this program and, and maybe sponsor some of the teens. And that's what and originally they were meeting about. So we talked about that for a while, and small talk for a while. And said, finally, I said, listen, what's this great idea? I've got I've to move along here. So they both smiled, kind of conspiratorial smile there, and said, Bruce, Bruce Comiskey was the CEO of the Children's Hospital. He said, he's, he's got a brilliant idea. He wants the zoo to put an exhibit in the hospital. And uh, normally, I love brainstorming. And you know brainstorming, there are no bad ideas. You know, always encourage everybody's idea. It's a good idea. And with that in mind, I looked at him and said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You can't put a, a zoo exhibit in a children's hospital. I said, well, what were you thinking? What kind of exhibit were you going to put in a children's hospital? And he said, oh, we were thinking monkeys. I said, monkeys? You can't have monkeys in a children's hospital. Have you ever heard of zoonotic diseases? You can't do that. And he said, well, what about birds? You know, I want something lively, something colorful. I said, you know, I'm picturing zookeepers running through a hospital with nets trying to catch loose birds. I said, no, you know, you just can't, just can't do that. And he said, well, what could we put in the hospital? So those of you that fish, and I know everyone in Oregon fish, fishes, uh, and that's the point where uh, I bite the hook. Uh, I should have just said, no, it's not going to work. No such thing can't happen. Instead, I said, well, maybe you could do, you know, like reptiles, something moving, slow moving, something easy to care for, pet store kind of things. At that point, the hook was set. As he said, all right, let's do it. And before I knew it, I had uh, caught up with this guy's enthusiasm and his passion. And I believe greatly in, in people with passion. And I know that uh, there is no good idea unless that idea has a champion, someone that wants to carry it through. And it was clear this guy was going to be a champion for this idea. So I said, all right, I will work with you. We can make this work. And uh, we went out. And together, we found a donor who was willing to give $40,000 to pay for this exhibit. And I can't tell you how pleased my boss was with me when she found out I found a donor to give $40,000 to another institution. <laughs> that, was, uh, that made me a lot of points that day. But you know, I survived that. And their staff and my staff worked together to put this great exhibit together. We worked hard on it. We were a few months from opening it when Bruce accepted a job at a children's hospital in New York City and left. 
And I said, all right, well, by now I'm passionate about this too, and we're going to make it happen, and it's going to be great. Well, my exhibits department starts coming back to the zoo and saying, you better talk to somebody down there. There's a lot of grumbling going on. I just say, ah, yeah, 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 it's just because you're talking to the plumber. Plumbers are always grumbling. Don't worry about it. Uh, and they keep coming back and saying, you better talk to someone down there. So f finally, they call me down and said, we'd like to have a meeting with you. So I go in a room with my development director, he and I, and there are 12 people from the hospital in there, and they pull out a list of demands. So we don't, we don't like this exhibit you're building, and these are the things we want to see you know, happen here. And uh, they started rattling off all these problems they had with the exhibit. And I was pretty furious at that point and said, fine, I'm coming back tomorrow with a saw. I'm going to cut the exhibit out. I'm going to take it to the zoo and put it out. My development director, fortunately, was, was there, and he called me down and said, no, no, wait a minute. Let's, let's talk this out. And we, we went through it, and we made it, made it work, but uh, it was... Uh, it, an eye-opener for me to find out that Bruce, the guy who left, not only was the champion for that idea, he was the only one who thought it was a good idea. <laughs> Nobody at the hospital thought this was a good idea. Nobody. Every doctor, every nurse, every maintenance person thought this was a terrible idea. <sighs> so over the next year, yes, we were a few months from opening. It took over a year to get through it because there were so many people, had so many conditions, they were slapping on us that it took us over a year to get the exhibit open. Every day, I said to myself, never again, never again will I do this, never again. So finally, we get the exhibit done and we open it up and there's a big media hype about it, lots of uh, TV and radio there. Uh, school kids, two groups of school kids from different schools came and they had made posters of the animals and it was a, it was a big to-do. And then that was finally over and uh, when it was over, I had to go talk to the PR people from the hospital because we had heard Good Morning America was going to come and do five segments on this new exhibit and the teens that were taking care of it and all that stuff. And the hospital thought that three of the segments should be about hospital staff and two about the zoo. And the zoo thought three of the... Uh, I'm sitting there in this meeting with PR people saying, never again, never again, never again. Well, I finally we worked that out. And I left and thought, I haven't even seen the exhibit since it opened. I'm going to walk over and see the exhibit. So I started walking over. And as I'm walking across the lobby, uh, a little girl comes on the hallway, accompanied by someone who I assume was her mother. And the mother is pushing a, a saline stand, one of the stands that has a saline drip on it. The girl has an IV line in her arm. And she has no hair. She's lost her hair. I assume she was undergoing some kind of chemotherapy. And she had sunken eyes and big black rings under her eyes and had obviously lost a lot of weight. She was just skin and bones. And she was walking across the hospital, so respectfully I stayed, you know, behind them, 10 feet. I wasn't going to go, even though I was in the northeast, I wasn't going to push past them uh, to get somewhere. I walked slowly behind, and uh, turns out they were headed to the exhibit. So I, I stayed back and I watched, and uh, this little girl walked up to the exhibit, and I have to tell you, zoo exhibits, it's a funny thing about zoo exhibits, we open exhibits and that's when we get all the media attention and the hype over a new exhibit. The first day of an exhibit is when the exhibit is at its worst. The plants haven't grown in yet. Uh, usually we start out slowly so we don't have all the animals. The animals that are in there are just getting used to a new exhibit so they're hiding. Uh, but that's when people want to see new exhibits on the first day. But if you give an exhibit time, it, it gets better and better. So typical zoo exhibit. This one wasn't at its best. Most of the animals were hiding. Some of them didn't come in in time. There's one turtle swimming around in his tank that's clearly visible and looking, looking cool. And I watched as this little girl walked up to the tank and watched the turtle for a while. And as she watched the turtle, she pointed to the turtle and looked up at her mom and smiled. She got a twinkle in her eye, her face got some color in it, and she started giggling and pointing to the turtle. And at that point, I thought, this was worthwhile. This was worth doing. A child should never have to suffer, and a child certainly should never have to fight for their life. And to be responsible for just a minute to have that little kid forget about her pain and the fact that she was in a struggle for her life and to make that connection with nature and to smile and to have fun again was worth any hassle that I had to put up with for the last two years to make that exhibit happen. So the lesson for me there was that some days we get so caught up in the, the petty 
bickering and, and the day-to-day -day stuff, just getting the job done, that we lose sight of the big picture. And uh, that was a good big picture lesson for me. That's what the zoo is all about, is doing good for the community, making the community a better place, and doing good things for the people that live in the community. So those are four lessons I learned over the years that are great, gonna greatly affect the way I do my job in the zoo business. And uh, people ask about the master plan for the zoo and, and which direction the zoo is going in, what are we gonna do? And I usually ask when they wanna know that for me, what, you know, where are we going at the zoo? What are you gonna do next? And they usually wanna know, you know, what's your vision for the zoo? What animals do you see coming to the zoo? What exhibits do you see opening? And I, I answer that question honestly. I usually say, I have no vision for the zoo. Now I'll give you a tip if you're ever interviewing for a job and someone asks you what your vision is, it's probably not very smart to say I have no vision. <laughs> Fortunately for me, Mike Burton didn't ask me that question when I, <laughs> I interviewed with him. I'm surprised Don didn't ask that question either, but no one asked what my vision was, and it's a good thing. The reason I have no vision for the zoo in that regards, and what animals we're gonna have here and what exhibits, is I think that is something that's driven by the staff who understands what the conservation needs of the animals are around the world, and by the community who knows what they want to see at the zoo. My job is to, to listen to those folks. I'd be happy to listen to you today about what you want to see at the zoo and what the staff thinks is important for us to be working with and make some judgment decisions and do a little bit of juggling and, and figure out what we're going to have animal-wise. Uh, the real vision I have for the zoo is not in what animals we're going to have here and what exhibits we're going to open but in the kind of zoo we're gonna be. And two things that we're gonna do here that I'm really excited about. One is the city kid in me coming out. We are gonna reach out to uh, the underserved audiences, the, the people that don't get to come to the zoo very often or can't afford to come to the zoo or we haven't even marketed to. Uh, people who have English as a second language. Uh, people who just don't have the financial means to get out and do recreational activities. I want to see the zoo much more involved in the city, in the community, reaching out to uh, those audiences. So we already have a couple programs uh, underway uh, to do those kind of things, working with some teenagers and working with elementary school kids in the community. Uh, and those programs are just going to grow and grow over the, in the future. Uh, the other thing we need to do is to get out in the field. The zoos for so long have talked about conservation and said, oh yeah, we, we're conservationists. We breed endangered species in our zoo. We take care of endangered species and we breed them in the zoo. Well, if that's our contribution to conservation, then all we are are museums that have living animals in their exhibits. We're not making a difference. Uh, conservation has to happen out there in the field. So you're gonna see the zoo a lot more involved uh, in the field, and when I say the field, I mean anything outside our, our gates. Uh, it can be local in the metro region, uh, or in the state, or in other countries. And right now the zoo has projects going on in uh, Malaysia, uh, Peru, Rodrigues Island, and in the Indian Ocean. And for many years our zookeepers have been working to save rhinos in, in Africa and Southeast Asia. So we are getting out there in the field. We're going to get out there a lot more. The zoo is now working locally with um, with the fish and wildlife folks to uh, work with some endangered turtles and frogs that are found right here in, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, so you're going to see a lot more of that. As far as animals go, I'd be happy to hear what you would like to see here. I can tell you what's happening in the very near future, which is uh, next summer, the next phase of the Great Northwest is going to open, and that's going to be a slice of the Oregon coast with sea lions and sea otters and, and fish exhibits. And after that, we begin work on the forest and farm sections of the Great Northwest with animals like black bears and cougars and wolverines. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to do lots of small and, and medium-sized exhibits. We just brought tree kangaroos to the zoo. This summer, we're opening a lorry exhibit. Lorries are colorful members of the parrot family. We're going to let people go in with the lorries. And in fact, we're going to let people feed the lorries. You buy a little cup of nectar, and you can stand there, and the lorries will come and land on your, your head and your arms. And you may take a little souvenir home with you. <laughs> and we've already made the decision we're not going to charge you extra for that. It's just a little souvenir of the zoo on us, or on you as the case may be. Uh, we're also opening a meerkat exhibit in the next couple months. Meerkats are those wonderful little animals from the Lion King. 
Uh, they're members of the mongoose family. So lots of, lots of things happening, lots of small things, lots of big things. But when it comes to the 25-year plan and what exhibits are we going to have, this is dangerous for a Metro employee to say, but I see my boss is over there watching me. But I believe strongly in planning, which is good because that's what Metro is all about, planning. I don't believe in plans. Planning is a dynamic, ongoing process. And the minute you finish planning and you have a plan, you sit that plan down and the next day you come in and your plan's a day old. And a month later it's a month old. And 10 years from now it's a 10 year old plan. And if you're doing things based on something that was planned 10 years ago, you're probably out of touch with what the needs are. So planning is something that, that to me is an ongoing process and I'd be crazy I think to tell you what we're going to be, what exhibits we're going to open in 20 years. I don't know. I can tell you we're going to be planning for the next 20 years and we'll open up what's ever most appropriate at that time. But one of the things that will help us decide that is what, uh, what people want to see. So what I'd like to do now in just a few minutes left is uh, take your questions and love to hear your criticisms of the zoo or your suggestions for what you think we should have here, what animals you would like to see come or programs you'd like to see developed. Susan, the first question. Thank you, Tony. It's, it's a delight to be here today. I think for many of us, it's the first time to see this beautiful building and the improvements. The entryway is so welcoming. Um, and I want to focus on the transportation problems here. We know that there's concern about parking. Um, many of us that are devoted Portlanders and devoted to alternative transportation are thrilled with the opening of the West Side Light Rail. How many came by train today? Great. I'm proud of you, City Club. I want to remind Tony that he can also pop downtown to go to City Club luncheons by train, so we'll, we'll welcome you there. Um, I would like to hear how the zoo plans to increase from 30 percent, that is sort of the current number um, that they see coming by train. I want to get some ideas on how we're going to attract all those wealthy West Side, Intel, et cetera, employees to come to the zoo uh, by train. How can we increase that? Are we doing anything to um, record zip codes as they come in? Do you know where they're coming from? And uh, can we deduct some from our tickets if we come by train? So those are my questions. Well, I wish I would have known your question earlier because I could have just pushed you off the side of the stage there. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's a very good question, and it's one I deal with uh, every day. Uh, you know, parking and transportation are big issues for us at the zoo. And uh, I will tell you, I'm uh, Mike Burton. Uh, called me a train hugger one time, I think. I love Max, and I uh, use it regularly. I don't use it to go to work because it doesn't work for me. It's actually further to a parking ride than it is to the zoo, so I drive to the zoo, but whenever I have a meeting downtown or go to a city club lunch, which I've done, I take the, uh, the max down. Um, here's some really bad news for you. The 32% ridership that we saw was from our winter survey that we did in November. We just completed the spring survey and found our ridership on the max was 16% of our visitors. I don't think that's bad. I think 32% was way beyond our wildest dreams. 16% I think is very good. When I first came here and saw what was happening, I thought if we got double digit percentages, if we got 10% or more, that would be good. I think 16 is great. The much more important information I got out of the survey was not the number of people that are using Max, but the follow-up question was if you did not use light rail today, why not? And the thing that was most encouraging to me, or on one hand, depressing on the other. Only 6% of the folks we interviewed said that they didn't know about light rail. So uh, I've been you know, criticized before the zoo should be working harder to promote light rail and make sure everything, every piece of printed material has light rail advertised on it. And you know, we're trying, but I don't know that that's the issue. I think people know about it. Uh, only 6% didn't know about it. Much more telling to me was that only 1% of the folks said it's too expensive, one percent. So again, people have said, well, why don't you just make the zoo free for anyone that uses light rail? 
I don't think money's the issue. I don't think people aren't using the light rail to come to the zoo because they can't afford it. 59% uh, of the people said it wasn't convenient from where they lived, and another 19% said it was just too much hassle to ride the train. Now, I don't work for TriMet, I work for Metro. I could make it my mission in life to teach people how to use the train more efficiently and more effectively, and, and I'm doing my part, I think, but it's not a campaign that I think the zoo needs to spearhead a, a campaign to get the citizens of Portland to use light rail. I'll do my part, and I would love to see more people use light rail to come to the zoo. It's good for business, but, but I think we're already doing a lot. Good afternoon, Erwin Mandel, City Club member. I think your notion of the outreach program is probably one of the most valuable notions you've come up with. And I'd like to ask you a rather naive question, perhaps. With an outreach program, would it be at all possible for you to have, oh, well, let's say, a semi-trailer truck with some exhibits in that truck that could go around to the schools for the kids to see the animals at that point. Thinking about that young girl with uh, pushing the IV drip around and the reaction you got there. I would think if they had an opportunity to go in one end of the trailer, out the other, and to stand and watch whatever type of animals might or might not be capable of being seen in that way. Done. <laughs> Done. Love those kind of questions. We do that. Actually, no, that's okay. Uh, it's a little different than the way you described it. We don't have traveling uh, exhibits. We have traveling animals, and our education department has uh, two different outreach programs. Our bird of prey show goes on the road, and uh, we have education animals that we take not only to schools but to nursing homes and uh, other places that, where people can't come to the zoo. We go to them, and we have a whole collection of animals that are pretty much specially picked because they're animals that we can handle, we can take into a classroom, and, and that's a very popular program and a very valuable one. Thank you. Uh, Josephine Pope, City Club member. To a degree, you've answered this question, uh, but I'll press on anyway. Uh, my question has to do with the zoo's impact upon its neighbors, its residential neighbors and its institutional neighbors. The uh, communication and awareness um, has improved under, I will have to say, Terry Dell Simpson and Kathy Kiwanis and others. However, traditionally, the zoo has not been, uh, not appeared to be overly concerned about the impact of its internal decisions uh, upon its exterior. And I'm wondering what your, I won't say plans, but what your thinking is with regard to this, particularly as it might relate to limits upon growth. Uh, well, I can't speak for things that happened before I was here. Uh, but I will agree with you. I think Kathy and Terry uh, and some of our other staff, I see uh, Jane Hartline from our marketing department is here. And uh, we have a lot of people on our staff that really do a good job, I think, uh, reaching out to the community. Um, I won't say our neighbors are all happy with us, but uh, we work really hard uh, to try to be a good neighbor. Uh, recently we just had a meeting where the neighbors were all invited to talk about the concert series. Even though we didn't get any complaints last year, that wasn't good enough and we uh, still wanted input as to what any outstanding issues were with our concert series and how could we be better neighbors. Are there things that are happening that maybe, maybe they happened and no one bothered to complain. Um, so we are looking at that. As far as growth goes, the zoo's kind of stuck here where we don't have much room to grow. Uh, but as we get more popular, and that is my job, I want to make the zoo more popular, I want more uh, people to come here, um, it is going to be an impact on the neighbor. That means more cars coming through and more parking problems. And We're working to solve those problems. Uh, Mr. Burton, again, has come up with a very good idea that uh, it's one of those ideas where he's the boss. We didn't really discuss this. He said, you need to put out a newsletter that goes out to the neighbors to keep them informed of what's happening and, and give them kind of a mechanism for feedback. Uh, I'm sure you know Mr. Burton is very much into citizen input uh, and has encouraged me to, to seek that out. So we're trying to be a good neighbor. There are some things that are always going to be a problem. I mean, I have neighbors that think they should be allowed to park in the parking lot and use the light rail. They use their parking lot, use our parking lot as their personal parking lot to use the light rail. I'd like to accommodate them, but it's a business decision. I can't make them happy on that one. Uh, 
those parking places are too valuable. On other things, every other issue I've heard, I think it's really easy for us to work together and solve those problems. Traffic and things like that, they're, they're solvable problems. And you're right, I'm not traditional. I'm going to reach out to the community and, and listen to what they have to say. Time for one more question. Two, a two-part last, last question. The first part is, what are you doing or planning to do, or thinking about doing, excuse me, or what should you be doing in terms of cooperative programs with other institutions in the state? I'm thinking the Oregon Coast Aquarium, for example. And then the second part is, what did you find in the cave? <laughs> okay, good questions. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm a huge believer in collaboration and cooperation and um, I don't look at other institutions in the state as competition even if they have animals like the aquarium. Right now the aquarium is kind of distant for us to do any really strong collaborative work with. Jane Hartline again our marketing person is on a group that the aquarium is on as well and the institutions work together with the many other institutions in that group too that work together to cross market each other uh, and really promote the metro region and not just their individual institutions. So, so that's one thing we can do. Locally, um, I think there are a lot more opportunities. The zoo has just teamed up with the Audubon Society and the Nature Conservancy to bring uh, a lecture series uh, to Portland, which will be uh, lectures on conservation biology topics. Um, we are going to uh, market them to our joint memberships and, and uh, host them right here at the zoo. Uh, so we're going to work together with local organizations. Those kind of relationships tend to grow into other projects and opportunities. So I'm a big believer in it. We don't have too much yet. I've only been here a year, but you'll see a lot of cooperative things in the future. Um, the second question, uh, it was um, uh, anticlimactic, I guess, when we got there. There were uh, lots of Mayan uh, artifacts there. Uh, the way he described it to me at dinner, I was picturing you know, little shelves in the cave with these vases sitting there. And, uh, it wasn't the case. There were, uh, there were mostly uh, pottery shards, there were big chunks of pottery shards. And respectfully, I left everything there and, and left. And the funniest uh, back to that is the uh, boys, once they got us there, after a four hour hike, were very anxious for us to leave because they were afraid that fertilances. <laughs> tend to live in the cave, so I seem to be constantly shadowed by these Fertilands things, but uh, so it was a little bit of a disappointment, but it's still neat to know that you know, no one had ever been in there before, no Americans had ever been in before. That was kind of a neat experience. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. I hope we can come back again. We're adjourned. <laughs>